the First World War, uh, historians increasingly recognize, was a watershed, and the great watershed of 20th century history. What came out of the First World War was, first of all, the establishment of communism in a great power, Russia. Uh, it's extremely doubtful that Lenin and his few thousand Bolsheviks could ever have come to power in Russia except for the dislocations and chaos produced by a losing war on the part of the Tsarist government. Also out of the First World War came fascism in Italy and the uh, fascist movement throughout Europe uh, because of a vindictive peace treaty after a uh, little more than a decade uh, the Nazis came to power in Germany and uh, with them the uh, seeds of World War II also to be found in the First World War. And more generally and abstractly uh, throughout the world uh, there came uh, throughout the uh, uh, came uh, state, state planning on an unprecedented scale. Um, by 1900 we already witness the uh, twilight and decline and um, lingering death of classical liberalism in the Atlantic world. Uh, liberalism had been in decline since uh, around 1870, uh, if we take the date uh, proposed by the British legal historian Dicey. Um, by the 1890s, a British liberal politician could say, we are all socialists now. Uh, one of the things that had aided in the demise of liberalism was the rise in the 1880s of the welfare state. This was the idea of the German <laughs> statesman Otto von Bismarck. And it's interesting that people don't consider the origins of the welfare state a little more closely. Uh, Bismarck, after all, was a militarist, an authoritarian, a man who distrusted liberalism and parliamentary government and initiated and pioneered the welfare state. Uh, it's as if um, the time had come in the history of uh, economic development where there was a possibility that the average person and the average working person could finally become independent, self-reliant, uh, the master of his own fate because of the progress of industrial capitalism. And it was at that point that Bismarck uh, reattached the masses to the state through welfare legislation and again made them reliant on the state for uh, pensions, sort of pensioners of the state, people who were going to be tied to the state through gratitude for all the uh, benefits the state gave them. You see that. It could have been a different development, but the welfare state came in there to reattach the masses of people uh, to the government in, um, in uh, gratitude uh, for these benefits. Uh, Bismarck was aided along these lines by the rise in Germany of uh, academics called socialists of the chair. That is, they weren't socialists like the Marxist socialists in the street. They were very prominent professors. As a matter of fact, they were anti-Marxist. But they did preach the kind of, of uh, socialism and pro-state ideology that George Smith was talking about last time as having been preached in the United States the need for centralization, the need for state control in the economy. These ideas are spreading throughout the Western world. Um, and there are some significant dates in the first decade or so of the century as far as the, uh, uh, the leadership of the international liberal movement goes. In 1903, Herbert Spencer dies. One of his last essays had been an attack on the imperialist British uh, effort in the Boer War. And Herbert, Herbert Spencer says, all my life I was a British, British patriot in the sense that uh, England was the uh, home of many uh, individual liberties. It was the home of the respect for the industrious, enterprising middle class, but my British patriotism died in the imperialist Boer War. In 1906, uh, the last great German uh, the uh, last great German liberal, Eugen Richter, dies. Uh, he had voted against uh, Finterpitz's uh, naval buildup in the uh, uh, last few years in the Reichstag. And in one of his last speeches, he says, 
If we let the banner of liberalism fall, we who are the last, then who will take it up again? And uh, there was to be nobody who would take it up again. And uh, what is to happen in the next decades in, uh, in Germany to Richter's beloved uh, German people uh, and by Richter's German is uh, a true tragedy. It's not anything that a, uh, that a classical liberal of the time could have imagined the decades to come in this, in this awful 20th century. In 1910, William Graham Sumner dies, and one of his last acts had been uh, a decade before to uh, attack the Spanish-American War, uh, the American annexation of the Philippines, and the war, the least known war, the war we waged for three or four years against the Philippine people. Uh, in order to subdue them to American rule. In 1912, Gustave de Molinari, uh, the great um, uh, Belgian-French uh, economist and the uh, dean of the classical liberal school of French economists in his time, dies also. Around this time, uh, one of the last liberals who's left, the Italian Pareto, <clears throat> says everyone is a socialist. They're either revolutionary socialists or they're nationalist and protectionist socialists. Uh, but there's no one who believes in the free society in Europe anymore. This is the period also of the growth of imperialism. Uh, the famous uh, rebirth of imperialism <clears throat> after a kind of lull in the middle of the 19th century, actually uh, largely caused by classical liberal ideas and values. After around 1880, imperialism becomes not only a, 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 an important movement again, it becomes a frenzy, uh, especially as we approach the end of the century and the first years of the 20th century. There are a number of reasons for this, for this rebirth of imperialism. You understand what's involved, especially the scramble for Africa, as it's called. A number of reasons for this. One is that it begins to drift back and then steadily, uh, uh, gradually, uh, more and more quickly towards protectionism. The era of pretty much universal free trade is a very, very short one, just about in the middle of the century. In um, 79, Bismarck in the new, uh, Bismarck in the new uh, great unified German Reich decides to go over to a protective tariff. Uh, in the years that follow, France, which was, had always been tempted uh, to do so, had been a classical uh, country of protectionism, does the same. Uh, Russia, Austria, Hungary, and um, other countries. Now, you understand that with a regime of protectionism, uh, this makes imperialism much more likely. If there's universal free trade, then it doesn't really make very much of a difference who owns a particular colony in the sense of who has military or political sovereignty over it. If we have a regime of universal free trade, then it doesn't really make much of a difference whether Britain owns Jamaica or France owns Jamaica, or Jamaica's independent. Okay? Because the Jamaicans will buy goods uh, in the cheapest market and they will sell goods in the dearest market regardless of the nationality of the suppliers and the buyers. So the imperialist country only has the expense of keeping up the government, uh, exercising uh, political jurisdiction, having a military garrison there and so on. There is no economic advantage to any major group in the home country. With protectionism, it's different, and you can force some captive uh, area in Africa to buy from you rather than from someone else. This does help certain uh, elite groups in the home market. So with the growth of protectionism, there's a concomitant growth of uh, imperialism. Another element that's involved, a political element uh, of the time, is the fact that France had been defeated in the War of 1871, which led to the unification of Germany and created this great unified German Reich right in the middle of uh, Europe. <clears throat> and overseas expansion was a way for the French to uh, sort of uh, uh, reestablish their pride. Okay, they had been defeated by the Germans. They were no longer the premier nation on the continent of Europe, but after all, <clears throat> they um, had the Foreign Legion in Algeria. They had uh, uh, a navy in uh, Indochina. They were taking big chunks of Africa. <clears throat> and the French were one of the leaders of imperialism at the time. Now, as far as imperialism goes, uh, there's a famous movement at around, uh, um, around 1900 <clears throat> that's important in the history of thought that seeks to link imperialism very closely with capitalism. 
Okay? Uh, this includes some a uh, number of Marxist authors and also an important British so-called liberal, called himself a liberal at this time. It's an indication of how far liberalism had come. <clears throat> uh, the German uh, Hilferdink <coughs> writes a book called Finance Capital. Uh, the Polish Marxist Rosa Luxemburg, the same. The most famous is the book that Lenin himself writes in 1917, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. <clears throat> At around the same, t well, uh, around 1902, a British radical, that is not Marxist, but radical, named J.A. Hobson, writes Imperialism, a Study. And this is all an attempt to um, debit imperialism to the account of capitalism. And it's interesting, in the history of thought, uh, the circumstances under which this comes up. <clears throat> Joseph Schumpeter uh, was a great economist, a great social philosopher, <clears throat> wrote a book called Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy after the Second World War. He makes a very interesting statement. He's, he says, capitalism stands trial before judges who already have the sentence of death in their pocket. And what I take that to mean, as he explains, is that regardless of the charge that's made against capitalism, the time comes when capitalism, let's say the market basically, is acquitted of that charge, a new charge will be brought up. And an indefinite number of charges until the guilty verdict is reached and the verdict of, uh, and the sentence of death is pronounced. Around 1900, it had become obvious that the Marxist predictions about the market were not coming true. Okay? It was not the case that the middle class was disappearing, the totally, total monopoly was coming into existence. It was not the case that the business cycle had reached the point of collapse of the capitalist system. Above all, it was not the case that the workers were getting poorer and poorer. That's what, they, that's what Marx and Engels had said in the 1840s. They never changed their view. But by 1900, they, you simply could not deny the evidence of your senses. The working class in uh, capitalist societies was becoming richer and richer. OK, so that's, that set of accusations and charges against capitalism has to be put aside. And uh, the revisionists, as they were called, in Germany and in other places, led by the moderate Marxist Bernstein, say, we cannot use these charges against capitalism anymore, unfortunately. All right? Right. But the sentence of death is still there. You have to have some charge to, um, uh, 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 to give the sentence, to justify the sentence. And the new charge then arose. Capitalism may not be responsible for <clears throat> the collapse of uh, the economy or uh, cartelization or um, uh, the uh, poverty of the working class, which are not real facts but it is responsible for a new horror and evil called imperialism. So this charge of imperialism then takes the place of the older discredited charges. With always the same psychological background, which is that there's no way this defendant is gonna get off the hook. <clears throat> Whatever charge we have to bring up. When I was a kid, it was the affluent society. Okay, that's before the war on poverty was discovered. <clears throat> it was uh, not only the affluent society, it was the, the, the contemptible taste of American consumers in, in preferring tail fins on their cars. <clears throat> this was the message of John G Kenneth Galbraith in those days. All of these awful things are supposed to prove something uh, rotten and decadent <clears throat> about capitalism. Now, according to these theorists, <clears throat> what was responsible for imperialist expansion was the need of capitalist economies to place investments overseas. Okay, the need, because of the falling rate of profit, to find areas in the third world that would bring profitable investment. So this capital flow was supposed to bring the capitalists there. Once the capitalists are there, the capitalists look around and say, it's better if our own government, our own system of laws here, will work together with the politicians and force them to take over this area. <clears throat> now, since these theories were developed, um, around 1900 and, and uh, between 1900 and 1917, let's say. Historians, that is not uh, theorists or pol polemicists like, uh, of course, Lenin, <clears throat> but actual historians have been at work on this thesis. 
to try to test it. <clears throat> and I've uh, actually done some work. In fact, I, I teach a course on theories of imperialism. The fact of the matter is, when it comes to testing this thesis by actual empirical work, the thesis collapses at every point. And I can refer you to the works of D.K. Fieldhouse, for instance, a British economist. The Theory of Capitalist Imperialism is his book. Okay, an, an older book in the 20s, Eugene Staley. Uh, Imperialism and the Private Investor. And there are specific books for specific countries. As far as France goes, the French historian Brunschwig, Henri Brunschwig. Okay, and uh, a very nice little book has uh, recently been published, pu published last year by Oxford University Press that very neatly summarizes many of these issues. It's a translation uh, from uh, a German historian named Baumgart. Okay. And it's called Imperialism, a nice short uh, treatment, really, <coughs> summarizing many of the findings. What, did these what conclusion did these historians come to? First of all, it is impossible, it, it's inconceivable, to uh, explain the imperialism of many of the imperialist powers of the time through the need for overseas uh, capital investment because these countries were net capital uh, importers. There was no such thing as a capital glut in Russia. Uh, if not the chief imperialist uh, country of the time, certainly one of the most important imperialist countries of the time. <clears throat> Russia was an enormous importer of capital, especially from Western Europe. No capital glut in uh, Japan, which had become an imperialist power. No capital glut in Italy. Italy became an imperialist power at the time. <clears throat> the Italians, uh, these things uh, have a s sort of uh, division of labor about them. The Italians uh, around 1900 specializing in the collection of deserts. Um, <clears throat> Why deserts? Well, <clears throat> they, I must, they must know it in Rome, uh, but uh, Eritrea, Somalia, and, um, and Libya. Um, there was very little uh, capital for export in Germany. Um, as a matter of fact, when the time came for the Germans to get the concession from the Ottoman government to build the um, railroad to Baghdad, Okay, there wasn't enough free German capital for export available. They had to call in French capitalists also. Okay, uh, the United States, by the way, at the time was a net capital investor, uh, importer also, still by 1900. Uh, then, of the countries which did export capital, where did that capital go? To these third world areas? By no means. French capital went almost exclusively <coughs> to uh, southwest and southern Europe to the Balkans, and very largely, maybe about 40% of it, to Russia. Not to any area that they're taking over imperialistically, but to these other areas. British capital, for instance, went to the old empire, that is Canada, India, Australia, and so on, to the United States, to Argentina, but again, not to these areas which were being taken over imperialistically at the time. So there is really no connection between this alleged need to place capital and imperialist expansion. <clears throat>